gracious Heavenly Father, as we boldly approach the throne of grace, I would just ask that you would take and seal to our hearts that grace and truth that came through our Lord Jesus Christ. We just give you all the glory and all the honor and the praise, thanking you for this opportunity to come together again and feast upon your word. May your word bless our hearts, encourage us, and comfort us along our way. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in 2 Corinthians verse by verse. We're in chapter 8. Uh, we're looking at 8 and 9 now here, and it's the uh, two chapters, uh, primary chapters that deal with the subject of God's grace and giving. So we're going to continue on with that. Uh, I want to point out from the very beginning here that there are many Christians today who do not believe that we're actually saved by grace and grace alone when the fact of the matter is that we have two epistles that were written to a carnal group of believers, 1 Corinthians pointing out their carnality, 2 Corinthians showing us how that it was God's grace and grace alone that brought about results or change in the lives of these carnal believers. I also pointed out, I believe in uh, one of my last videos on concerning the subject of giving and that being the grace of God that why should it be any different when it came when it comes to giving why should we leave grace out of the, the equation we were looking at uh, in our last study we were looking at grace in relationship to giving uh, in the eighth chapter we're beginning to merge into the ninth chapter which continues on with that same subject uh, the Holy Spirit addressed an epistle to the believers at Corinth and we looked at their condition they were questioning the authority of the Word of God they were immoral in their lives and they were callous towards sin there was fighting in the group where they were insisting on their own rights uh, even at the expense of others There was fornication, there was a lack of dedication in marriage and uh, the marriage promises, idolatry and impurity and worship, uh, misuse of the spiritual gifts, uh, the lack of understanding of why that they were given and the, why the gifts were given in the first place and what the Holy Spirit had intended to do with them. And there was a lack of hope, the blessed hope the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ being our hope, and the Holy Spirit addressed these principles to a body of believers whom he called precious and elect according to the grace of God. We went on to see that it was the grace of God that caused their hearts to turn to the Word of God. It was the grace of God and with dramatic results. And I think that the lesson for us is that the solution in our walk, in the problems that beset us, is the Word of God. Not personal commitment, not rededication, not some kind of an emotional high or, or a, a two-week vacation to the Bahamas, but the Word of God. If you remember back in 1 Corinthians, we read that, you know, when I came to you, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And of my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom. It is the Word of God that counts, not the oratory, not the surroundings, not the environment, not the special effects, not the situation. We saw how that their response to the Word of God, not the Word of Paul, but the Word of God, actually touched hearts. Greater praise and reverence of the Lord 
a greater understanding of His grace and of His love. And by the time that we, we reached the eighth chapter, we began to see the practical outworking of this. And God's Word is just as timely, uh, you know, relevant today as it was then. I pointed out, or, or I hope that I pointed out, how that the Word of God ministered by the Holy Spirit produces practical results in the life of the believer in Christ. It's interesting to me that in chapters 8 and 9, we have two chapters to show us how that there is a practical lesson here for you and for me. First of all, I've suggested uh, to you folks that the dominant subject of chapter 7 is grace. It's mentioned seven times. Not the giving of money, but grace. Fact of the matter is, it's rather in in interesting as we look at this section of Scripture that what we really see is a simple offering taken, collected among some Gentile churches to relieve some physical needs of some believers in Jerusalem. Some people wrote checks, uh, some used credit cards, PayPal, you know, I, I don't know, I, what, something like that. I don't know, but from our standpoint, in simplest terms, it's just an offering. But I see that the whole, I see the Holy Spirit use seven distinct nouns in speaking of what appears on the surface to be a very simple, casual, ordinary thing. Just taking up a collection, delivering it, distributing it. And, and churches have all kinds of special offerings all the time to help believers in need, as well as non-believers. The disadvantage with this church is that, you know, if you give to support this ministry, you will not receive free and postpaid by return mail the three following books, tapes, or CDs, or win a free trip to the Holy Land. In verses 1 and 7 of chapter 8, God calls it a grace, charis. Charis. It's an interesting word. God speaks of the source of this giving, the source of it, which is a practical outworking of God's grace. The source being a closeness in walk and fellowship with the Lord. And I think it's fantastic to know that I'm redeemed by grace, that God loves me in the midst of the foolishness and the sin in my life. All because God is faithful. And I believe that what we're seeing basically in chapters 8 and 9 is a practical outworking of the spiritual knowledge. In James, we're told that you haven't helped a man at all if he's hungry by saying, Be thou filled. Then you haven't helped him at all if he's cold by just saying, be thou clothed. I suggest to you that the Holy Spirit is teaching us in these chapters that the source of this practical outworking is God's grace. And, and folks, we could shrug our shoulders and say, well, so what? Dearly beloved, it makes a big difference. The source is not your goodwill. The source is not the fact that you are willing to help someone. That's not the source. You know, there are probably thousands of reasons to give. You know, here's a guy who he makes no claim whatsoever of, of knowing the Lord or loving the Lord Jesus Christ who gives to those that he sees in need. Now, I don't know why some do that. There's probably a, a possibility that never entered my head that I'd never thought of, but the motive here, here in our text, is grace. And it's God's grace. 
There's no, no possibility of us going through chapters 8 and 9 saying that it is our grace, folks. That's my point, okay? It is God's grace. The source of this giving, of this practical outworking, is God Almighty, folks. The reason Jesus Christ was rich and became poor was to put a willingness, a readiness in our hearts. The word fellowship in chapter 8, uh, verse 4, this, this same gift that we're talking about, this same offering, we find that the source is the grace of God. The fellowship, first of all, it, it's called grace. Secondly, it's called fellowship. And the source is God. It's not an isolated aid for believers at Jerusalem. It is a fellowship between believers at Corinth and in Macedonia and Jerusalem. It's a fellowship. We see in chapter 8 that it's a ministry. It's called a ministry. I suppose somebody could argue, you know, that it's only a, it's only a ministry really well for Paul or Silas or Timothy or, who, or whoever else. You know, whoever else was elected to be part and parcel of this experience. I believe that the word implies more than that, that it's a ministry for everyone who partakes in it. Do you have a ministry? Well, absolutely. Where is it? What's well, in the body of believers? What is it? It's the grace of God. Dearly beloved, everything we have, we receive from God. And everything that we receive from God belongs to God. We need to understand, we are stewards of this, that we're not giving our money, our time, our strength, our talent, our wisdom, our whatever. We're not doing any of those things. We have a ministry of the grace of God. And it's its area of operation is the body of believers, and God calls it a fellowship. Saying that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, you know, is another way of saying that, well, you know, everything belongs to God. Psalms chapter 50. We all know that the Lord owns every beast in the field and every, every bird in the air and every fish in the sea or in the rivers and lakes and ponds and whatever. Every creeping creature okay and that our needs are our needs are him there's an opportunity of ministry for each and every one of us and i'm not talking about just money folks we may we may never know what a word of encouragement really means to someone who desperately needs it life in christ is an opportunity it's an opportunity of ministry one way or another Money is only one aspect of it. You know, we tend to look in, in the wrong end of the telescope where we have no comprehension at all of how the body of Christ really functions. We have the opportunity to minister the grace of God in a fellowship among the body of believers. In, in, in verse 14 of chapter 8, verse 14, I see it called an equality. It is God's beautiful means of meeting the needs of each member of the fellowship. None accepted. Okay. The, the illustration given to us was manna in the wilderness. You know, surely it's clear that God provided the manna. God was the source of the manna, and God gave it, and God gave it faithfully every day. And every day, they grumbled, they complained, they they questioned Moses' authority. You know, they they yelled about God. You know, they, they worshipped cows, and, and who knows what all else. They disobeyed. They went astray. They were his sheep. They went astray. They went the wrong way. They went. They went when he told them to stay. They stayed when he told them to go. But the manna was there. The manna was there every day. And it was a distribution. 
according to the need. You know, it'd be feel, just plain ridiculous. It would be foolish, folks, to suggest that every man's needs are precisely equal. And so this ministry among the fellowship of believers of the grace of God is to meet the needs of every believer. But it's not Christian communism. It's particular needs met by God. But the process is one of equality. What we really have is a precious opportunity to share together in God's means of addressing those spiritual and physical needs of the body of Christ. In 820, it's called an abundance. I suppose if you, you know, if you had a million bucks and, a, and a, this guy that had nothing but a, a nickel to his name, you know, he's only got a nickel to his name and, and you give him, a, a, you know, a hundred dollars, I mean, that'd be, a, that'd be a super abundance to this guy, but it'd be petty cash to you. Maybe that's a poor illustration because I don't want to, I really don't want to limit this in any way to money or to possessions. You know, a kind word, a word spoken in season, I'm told by the Holy Spirit can be an abundance to the one who spoke nothing to the one who said it. I can't help but believe that one of the greatest surprises in the day of accounting is not going to be how horrible we were, but what God accomplished in the things that we did. I know that I'm getting old because I'm, I'm really starting to forget a lot. You know, I'm sliding down the hill and, and, and somebody will send me an email saying, you know, hey, Steve, remember those five minutes in Hot Springs, Arkansas? I changed my life. You know, I don't even remember being in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Guys, guys got to be mistaken. I mean, you got to be confusing me with somebody else. Oh, yeah, it was you, Steve. It was you. I, I don't even know who the guy's talking about. I wonder, dearly beloved, how many words fitly spoken in season you never know of. Absolutely no, you have no idea at all. God says he won't even forget a cup of cool water given in my name. I see abundance as the description that God uses from the standpoint of the one who receives it. And I believe the word abundance means not the abundance of money, not the abundance of money, but the abundance of grace. No place in all of this text do we have any idea how much money it was or whether, or, you know, for that matter, you know, it was, it was money. I mean, maybe it was canned goods, you know, pro probably not dehydrated foods. Uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know how they processed food for keeping back then. But I'm certain it probably included more than money. You know, I mean, from the standpoint of the one who received it, it was an abundance of grace. In 9.5, in the authorized version, I, I see a word that really just devastates me. Bounty. Well, I, well, I know what a bounty hunter is. You know, I know, you know, boy, do I know, you know, a verse in this Bible. 2 Corinthians 9.6. You know, I heard this when I was five years old. You know, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. And, uh, and our pastor, you know, when, when I was just a little guy, I mean, he knew, he knew what that meant. You know, if you guys would just, you know, just, just dig into the bottom, you know, you've got money in there that you haven't even spent yet. You know, there's more money in your pockets than there is in, in our church budget. There's more money in your pocket than what this church needs. I mean, he knew how to raise money. 
And over and over again, the verse was thrown at us. But the word bountiful, bountifully there, is eulogia. It's a, it's a word that means blessing. He who sows sparingly, well, there's no, there's no the in that verse. We had to put, we had to put the also, there's no also in that verse. We had to put that there in the English to make sure that, you know, you guys give. I'm sorry, okay, I believe that the verse was translated in 1611 to encourage giving. He who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. He who sows with blessing shall reap with blessing. And I see God call this the blessing. The result of grace is an abundant blessing to the receiver. It is an abundance. The result of the distribution of this grace is a blessing. I don't believe anybody Anybody who spoke the Koine Greek when this was written would have come up with anything but blessing. He who sows with blessing shall reap with blessing. You know, it may be the widow's might, but it'll be with blessing. And I believe God says that the result of this distribution is a blessing. In the 12th verse, I see it called a service. Suddenly I see in the, in the word that God by his grace has given me an opportunity to be a participator in that ministry. Surely God doesn't need me, okay? He doesn't, he doesn't, need, uh, he doesn't mean, need me to tell somebody else that they're redeemed, that they're members of his family and of his household. You know, he really doesn't, okay? I mean, there must be a tremendous number of ways that God could do that, you know, by, by visions, by, by dreams, by revelations, by animals speaking, by, you know, by, by stars, by I don't know what. Is not there some purpose in God choosing that you and I might be the vessels by which grace is administered? And doesn't that make sense? And more than that, that we might not only call it a ministry, which it, it surely is, but a service which would indicate that we at least have some part in it. I, I, I can't imagine that the Almighty God would deign to have me as a participator in any of His activities. Yeah. You know, such imperfection, such sin, such lack of sensitivity and understanding, and yet, and yet it seems to me that God is saying, up until now, it was the Lord Jehovah, it was His grace and His abundance and His distribution in the ministry of His affairs, but God graciously says to you and to me that it is also a service. And to me, the word implies that the servant is a participator, at least to some degree, in the ministry. Surely it, it merges into the area of reward, and I've, I've spoken a lot about that. Bema, building on Christ. You know, I've, I've spent some time talking about rewards, you know, that we're going to give an account of ourselves before God, not an, an account for sin, but in the use of our talents and how we built on Christ, the care of how that we administered our responsibility, our obligation as it concerns that ministry, that gospel, okay? To walk not according to the to law, but, but grace, building on that one foundation, which is Christ. Yet in the final analysis, our reward is based upon not our faithfulness alone, but our trust in God our trusting in Him. God is faithful. God is always faithful. God's grace, God's faithfulness. What does God require of a servant but faithfulness? In trusting God that He's faithful, that He can be trusted, 
but he didn't lie. You know, remember how ecstatic that we were, how ecstatic that, you know, that God did not require production, you know, because if, if he required production and if reward in, in fact was based upon production, then, well, then now you've got the overachievers, you've got the underachievers, you've got the super, super duper producers and, and you know, and then you and me, well, we're just kind of, you know, standing on the wayside here. You know, I sat for years thinking how wonderful it was that God only required faithfulness until I looked at my faithfulness. You know, when we first went through the passage, it seemed so wonderful that God did not require us to be producers, but to be faithful until one takes the inventory of their own faithfulness. No matter how we look at the Word of God, no matter how we look at it, we find that we are His servants to be sure. His, his, I'm, we're His sons. We're a lot of things, okay, to, to be sure. But we are, the, we are the recipients of His grace but we're also his servants. And folks, the servant does not choose. Doesn't choose. The servant doesn't choose. The Lord chose me. You know, hourly employees don't argue with CEOs of corporations. I mean, if they do that, they'll probably get fired. You know, they just do what they're told to do. Servants don't enter into committee meetings with God and say, you know, well now, okay, all right, let's let's sit down and let's hash this thing through. Let's kill this thing in committee, okay? You know, let, let's really talk about that, you know. And, and I and I'm afraid to that degree. Many of us as Christians, in fact, they we want to do just that, okay? I love to dwell on the fact that I am God's son, that I'm His child, that He is my Father. Those are all spiritual concepts, folks, but so is soldier and so is servant. You know, or sailor, you know, servant. You know, and the, and the soldier says, yes, sir. And the servant obeys. So it's marvelous. It's wonderful that I can have a participation, of, I can have a participation in this grace of God that there is, from my standpoint, some service, and that's true. But it would be wrong not to look at the other side and suggest that service implies obedience and, and, and faithfulness. Well, I mean, what does God require of a steward but faithful, to be faithful? And our position is not one of arguing with God. I mean, that doesn't really get us anywhere but submitting ourselves to God. The Lord Jesus Christ, he said to his disciples, our Lord said to his disciples, if you love me, you will guard my commandments. And it's, it's, it's awesome that our activity as servants and as soldiers is still motivated by love. But if we're to be fair with the text, okay, and with the illustrations that the Holy Spirit gives, there is also the matter of implicit obedience that's being under the hearing of another. The word obey doesn't mean do. It's an intense form of the word hearing. And that it's administered to a fellowship of believers by those who are ministers of that grace, the believer in one way or another participating in that ministry. The purpose of the distribution of that grace is that there might be an equal meeting of the needs. Not that it's thrown into a giant heap where, you know, it's precisely divvied up, divided, you know, but a meeting of the needs. He who gathered much had nothing over. He who gathered little had no lack. And so, uh, you know, to the receiver, it is an abundance to the one you know, who receives it? The result of this distribution and this service is a blessing, and it is carried on by servants who have the glorious, marvelous opportunity to participate 
in the distribution of the abundance, but also the responsibility to be faithful. When we get down to verse 20, you know, we read, we hope to avoid, says Paul, any criticism of the way we administer this generous gift or grace. We hope to avoid any criticism. Now, what in the world could that criticism be? You know, I'm not, I, I really try to resist trying just filling in the blanks here, but I don't, I don't think we're filling in the blanks if we logically deduce what that could possibly most likely be. Uh, I'll give you my opinion on that. Of course, you know, you'll, you'll, you can get a lot of opinions from a lot of different people. Of course, you know, uh, if, but, you know, if you want the right one, you need to, you got to come here, right? Y'all know that, okay, right? And I, and I hope some of you laughed at that. What could possibly be the criticism? First of all, the, the verse, no, take note of the fact that the verse says the way that we administer, not the way that we transport or deliver, okay? You know, getting the gift, the grace there, you know, is one thing, okay? Administering it according to the needs of each one is another. What would cause such criticism? Well, let me just throw something out here for your consideration. Well, this guy over here, okay, you know, Paul, you can't be, you can't be given, you can't help this, this guy. I mean, what, he's not, you, why are you helping him? You know, he's lazy, he won't work, he doesn't have a job, he's always in trouble, you know, whatever. You know, there's, there's got to be some reason, some way to make the guy qualify. He's got to qualify to receive this grace. I mean, the criticism being, I'm suggesting, is being, you know, the, the very criticism Paul is hoping to avoid here. We hope to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this generous grace. Well, to me, it just makes sense to suggest to you folks that the criticism would likely be uh, something along the lines of, you know, that uh, you ought to administer it uh, by, based on merit, not grace. And that's where I'm going to leave it, that, okay? So that's it. Uh, we'll pick up here where we left off, sort of. We're merging into Chapter 9. Uh, we still got a, you know, a ways to go to get through the, the subject of this. I, I think it's a wonderful topic. It's something that we need to understand. We certainly don't want to be um, helping others uh, based upon the, this, this false idea that, well, they, they've got to be worthy of it somehow. You know, it's just... I think we're going the opposite direction is what I, from that. So anyway, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time, rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.